going to be the last one I get today, so thank you. Uh, I commend y'all for being here on an 8 o'clock class for an 8 o'clock class. I, I wasn't real good at that when I was up here until I found journalism. And uh, that was the, the magic bean for me. Uh, I just want to see, uh, ask y'all to share with me, uh, how many of y'all plan on doing writing for for career? How many of y'all are maybe thinking about writing in a career? Okay. Uh, I'll tell you two things that I've learned. One is no matter what you do in life, no matter what career you have, writing is an essential part of it, no matter what you do. And be open-minded as you go through this process of college. Uh, I was a semester away from graduating in business, real estate, and insurance. And uh, that would have been a train wreck in my life. Uh, not made for me. I thought it was, but it was not. Uh, what changed for me was I'd always loved newspapers, always loved to read the newspaper, even as a, a young, young child. First thing I ever learned to read was a baseball box score. I'm not sure if anybody even knows what a baseball box score is anymore. But I was always connected to a newspaper. My family subscribed to two, and I read them both, especially the sports pages. Loved the sports pages. But as life goes, uh, you start thinking about, well, I got to make a living somehow, so somehow I chose real estate and insurance. But I found myself falling asleep in class, and I said, well, maybe this is not for me. So I really thought over the Christmas holidays about what I wanted to really do with my life, and I wanted to write. I wanted to be a sports writer. I wanted to write about football. I wanted to write about basketball, baseball, go to the games, write about it, write about the players. So I knock on uh, the door of Dr. Gail Denley, and I tell him my dream. And I said, um, I'm married. I have a baby on the way. I cannot be a professional student. I have to get out of here. But I want to get out of here with a journalism degree. And that, that sweet man sat down with me and treated me like I was somebody and mapped me out a deal to where I could go that semester to summer schools and in the fall semester and get out because I'd taken just about everything I needed except journalism. And I owe that man, uh, who's not with us now, but uh, I owe that man so much. And I had a chance to, to tell him that sitting on a porch at the Neshoba County Fair, just to tell him thank you. Uh, so, I'm in journalism, I am loving the classes, I start working at the Daily Mississippian, and I start uh, wanting to get a byline in the DM and cover something. And somebody said, well, spring football's coming up, why don't you, anybody want to cover that? Quickly raise my hand. So, I'd be the only media at practice every day. And Michael Sweet was a really good running back here. This is uh, the spring of 75. And he hurt his knee in practice. And so I wrote a story for the Daily Mississippian and for whatever reason, I was 
stupid enough or bold enough or whatever you, whatever you want to say to call the paper that I would really read all my life, the Meridian Star, sports department the next morning because they were an afternoon paper, called the sports department. Told him, I, told him who I was, I, you know, I was at practice, Michael Sweet got hurt, I have a story, um, I can, you know, rewrite it and, and send it to y'all if you want it. And Matt Gordon, the sports editor there, was kind of a crusty guy, and he, yeah, I do. So, I did that. And I thank Michael Sweet for his knee injury, because it wound up, I became a regular stringer for the Meridian Star. And that's where I got my first job out of Ole Miss. Just a freak thing of accidents, but, or fate, however how you want to look at it. But uh, I was telling a friend that, that story the other day, and he said, how much did they pay you? And I said, nothing. It never occurred to me that they might pay me for something. I didn't care. I never discussed money, and they didn't either. They just kept getting my stories. So when I think back now, I must have really loved it because it, money was uh, not something I even thought about. I just thought about writing and getting a byline in the paper. My mom got the paper, my first byline, calls me. She's screaming. Your byline's in the paper. Yeah. And uh, it never got old to see it, no matter how long you, you wrote. Curtis, did you look at your byline? You looked at your byline when it came out in the paper? <laughs> oh. But that's, when, when I was in, your shoes, in your seat, I wasn't sure where life was going to re lead me. I, I, I had no idea. I just urge you to be open, open-minded, and, and, and really think about what you're passionate about. Don't worry about the money. I know that's, a, that's not really the greatest thing to say, and your parents would say, don't listen to that guy. But... If you love it enough, the money will work out for you. Opportunities will work out for you. Uh, and everybody says, well, how, how, did you, how did you learn to write? And I've thought, I've thought a lot about that through the years because I got asked that a lot. How, how did you learn to write? Well, the first way was uh, in my high school, typing was mandatory. And had no idea I'd ever even use it. I took typing. Thank goodness I took typing. But then, even before that, my family had what was known then as a country store. It was the only store within miles of, 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 of where we were, up in Knoxville County, Mississippi. Macon, between Columbus and Meridian, east side of the state. And working in that store, it was, uh, it, was, it was Grand Central Station. We had every, every walk of life come in that store every day. Uh, we knew everything uh, that was going on. We knew who was on vacation. We knew who, whose baby was sick. We knew who had just lost her job. We had a guy who would bring his wife in on Friday to buy groceries. We had, and the same guy would bring his girlfriend in on Saturday to buy groceries. <laughs> That's fine. It's just my job to check them out. But we knew everything, and that was a rush. I mean, we knew everything going on, and I loved it. But the greatest thing was people would gather there in their spare time and just sit and talk, and I would sit and listen. 
and the stories they would tell and how they told them, the words they used, the phrases they used. And I loved them. I loved all the stories. An example. Uh, there was a guy named John Henry Butler. He was a, a, a truck driver. He hauled clay. He would haul clay to the mill for, uh, to, to the uh, brick plant in Macon. And he would make about 12 loads a day and then come by the, come by the store. Way behind our store, there was a, a beaver dam. Big body of water. When I say big body of water, you got to understand big body of water for rural Mississippi. All right? And he would go down there. And when I tell you there were snakes down there, as my son likes to say, they don't, they don't bite you, they swallow your foot that big. He would go down there, wade out to the water, and, and he would tell these stories. And he would say, he would catch them and put them on a stringer and put them by his side, and he would see a water moccasin coming toward him. And he said, I would just take that stringer of fish and hold it out. The snake would bite that stringer of fish and he would just let it back down. Snake would curl his tail around his leg and just eat the fish while John Henry fished. That's the kind of guys we had coming in the store. You can learn something from guys like that. I never did that. He wanted me to, no thank you, no thank you. But it was listening to those people that really I think subconsciously, or ever how you want to say it, really struck a chord with me. And there are a thousand ways to, to have that chord struck, but that, that's the way it was for me. Uh, when I started writing, and I really learned that, I, I really learned this at the Daily Mississippian. Uh, when I started covering football, I was much more interested in the, in, in the players than the score. People want to read about people. Scores are going to come and go. Come and go. It's the players they're going to remember. Guarantee you. Laquan Treadwell broke his ankle against Auburn. Remember that? Any of y'all remember that? Can anybody tell me the score of the game? <coughs> Point made. That's, that's, you remember about Laquan Treadwell. When people, when somebody kicked a winning field goal, I'd go in the dressing room, everybody would be at the kicker. I'd go to the holder and the snapper. That's who could tell you the stories. I, I, I'm, my brother, who, who graduated from law school up here, told me this way back, way back then. He said, if you do it like everybody else, you're going to be like everybody else. If you do it like everybody else, you're going to be like everybody else. And I always try to remember that. And it it worked out to where I got different kind of stories than the people that I was trying to beat on a, on a regular basis. They beat me too, but I won my share. So what was it about that holder and snapper that was better than talking to the kicker? Well, first of all, the kicker, he can't remember anything. It's a blur to him. Every kick I ever told you, well, it was just a blur, really. Uh, but the snapper can tell you what he told him. He may have told him a joke. He may have told him whatever. There's so-and-so in the stands over here. Don't worry about them watching you. Just stuff like that. The snapper. Only time his name gets called is when he messes up. So it's pressure on him. But those guys are they're, they're, they're tight. They know each other. But that's just an example. 
go to some go to where everybody else isn't. And Curtis Wilkie was one of the greatest ever at that. He he he, he found stories where other people didn't. Um, everybody wants to know. Everybody asks. Why did you stay in Mississippi? Why did you stay in Mississippi? And that's not, that's not a, a hard question for me to answer. Um, Rick Cleveland is a friend of mine, a long, long time friend of mine, who's been a sports writer here in Mississippi for 40 years. And he and I used to talk about how it, would have a paper come in, like Atlanta or New Orleans or somewhere like that, and and talk to us, and then we would talk to each other. You know, what, what we felt, we we both wanted to stay in our home state. It meant something to us to write about Mississippians. It's who we knew. It's who we knew. And there's a. There's a quote from Faulkner. I wish I had it with me right now. But you know, he, he tried to write a lot of different stuff early on. He wrote a book about airplanes. I don't know how much he knew about airplanes, but it didn't go well. But when he started writing about what he called that little postage stamp of land right here that he knew inside and out, people inside and out, that's when it started clicking for him. Um, but it's, what does it mean to write about what you know? What does that mean? Can somebody tell me? <coughs> what do you think it means? Mm -hmm. <laughs> to write about what you know. What about things that, that, I'm sorry, what'd you, what, what'd you say? Like, write about things that you're just familiar with. You write better and you're more comfortable with what you're writing about. Yeah. It, it's, it's amazing to me to travel and, 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 and it, it's just different. No matter, you can go to Alabama and it's different to Georgia and it's different. Mississippians are unique in a, in, a, in a very sweet way most of the time. Most of the time. And I promise you there is no more fertile ground for stories than Mississippi. And that's why I wanted to stay here. That's why Rick wanted to stay here. It wasn't because we had the greatest teams. It wasn't because we had the greatest whatever. And he always stayed in sports, and I left sports to stay home because I had two sons coming up that were going to play high school football, and I didn't want to be in Gainesville, Florida on Friday night when they were playing football. But going to features was a great thing for me because it opened up a complete, instead of writing about 40 acres, I had the whole state to write about. And that was a... That was a a really a, a turning point for me because I think it it really improved my writing by talking to so many different kinds of people famous people not famous people people who should be famous there was a they said somebody suggested I go down 49 south there in Jackson and you know there's a long a long row of uh, I guess I hate to call them junk places, but that's what they are. They, 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 they consider themselves antique places, but junk places. So I said, okay, I'll, I'll go. And, 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 and so I drive and I find one that looks interesting and I pull in. And there's a guy there with a German shepherd that looked like a grizzly bear. He, one of the first things I ask when I'm going to interview somebody, do you have a dog? I did not ask him, but uh, 
I tell him what I'd like to do, and he said, yeah, come on in. So we sat there a while and talked and talked. And he got up and just started milling about. And I said, well, what did you do before you did this? What, was your, what were you doing? And he, there was a barrel of hammers there. And he, and he, he picked up a hammer. He said, well, just got out of the pen six months ago for killing my wife. And it's just me and him and that dog. Uh, okay. Uh, well, show me some of the stuff you have around here. Get him away from those hammers. <laughs> away from the hammers. But it turned out to be a story that people read. People would mail the clipping back in and say, we want more stories like this. Because he really had nothing to lose. He was free and open and talked, an interesting guy. I don't know if he killed his wife or not. He was convicted of it. He said he didn't, which made me feel a little better. <laughs> but he was an, just an interesting guy. And sometimes you find stories because you're desperate, completely desperate. I had two stories fall through. <coughs> And I had to have a Sunday story. And no editor had one. It was up to me to find one. So this, 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 I'll encourage you this. Build your sources. Build your sources. For whatever reason, I called the art gallery in Vicksburg. And I said, do y'all have any story that, that people would find interesting? And she said, oh, I'm not really. She said, uh, well, she said, we just had the, the uh, art done for the IBC competition, which was coming up in the summer. That's an international ballet competition, which I don't know how Jackson wound up with it, but it's also in Moscow. and." Uh, Rome, maybe, I'm not, I mean, it's four cities and it's, and Jackson. And I said, well, I don't, I was thinking, I don't know about, the, I don't know about the cover of the IBC program. But she said it was written by a guy who is homeless, or it was designed by a guy who is homeless. And I said, do what? And she said, designed by a guy who's homeless. She got me in touch with him. I go to Vicksburg, and I sit down, and I am mesmerized for the next four hours. You ever had somebody describe hunger pains to you? Hunger pains. When the front of your stomach feels like it's coming out the back of your stomach. And because he designed the cover of the IBC, he suddenly became a hot topic. Now his art is in galleries all over the southeast. I went back to see him. He has a home. But a lot of times, and I don't mind saying this, I, I, I'll, I, will, I will pray. I will say, lead me to the story I'm supposed to write. I don't mind saying that. Nine times out of ten, if a story falls through, a better one comes to you. And I firmly believe some stories do find you that you don't find them. Please remember that. Some stories will find you before you find them. And they were meant for you to write. We were talking outside about uh, your favorite, my favorite story to write, and it's, it's like my favorite $20 bill. I mean, it, it's, it's hard to pick. Your, your favorite child is hard to pick. 
Uh, but one of my first stories was I went to Shannon, Mississippi and interviewed Guy Bush, who gave up Babe Ruth's final two home runs. And he played in an era when you literally tried to hit the, hit the batter in the head. He was a pitcher. He, tried, he would try to hit the batter in the head. And he told me of that era, and he told me of Babe Ruth, and he, he told me how, how great he was. And I just sat there and looked at his eyes. I remember looking at his eyes and thinking what that man had seen. And that's what I wound up writing about. Was about he had a dog, too. I remember the dogs. <laughs> Chain link fence, and that dog jumped it to come see me, welcome me there. But that's the kind of stories that stick with you. But there's also a story that stuck with me about a woman outside Forest, Mississippi, who was literally living in a house that had caved in. I could not walk without stepping on something junk. I mean, it was stacked up newspapers, wrappers, uh, cracker boxes, ceilings, and it was just one electrical cord with a, with a light bulb, and that's how she, she lit her house. And she would sit in a chair by a phone. That's where she spent all day. And it was, it was the worst conditions I've ever seen a human being be in. But she was open, talked about it. She loved her house. She was happy there. But I loved her spirit. I didn't like her house. She needed to get out of there. Wrote the story. Some people donated money built her a new house. Those are the stories that wind up. Sometimes you say, why am I doing this? Why, why do I do this? Why do I go to work every day and write stories that we send out and I don't know who they reach. I don't know if anybody reads them. I don't know. That was before we could measure clicks, measure how many people are reading what, how long they're reading them and all that. Let me ask y'all a question. How many of y'all can remember Eli Manning playing at Ole Miss? Okay, a few. <laughs> you count. <laughs> uh, 2003 was his senior year. That's been, that's been uh, 14 years, or uh, 16 years. Right? We'd never heard at that time Facebook, Twitter, iPhone. That's not that long ago. Not that long ago. And here's what, here's what I want to tell you. I know you hear, you're hearing now about the demise of newspapers. Okay. And there is, a, there is something to that. I want to, I want to read this stat here. In, in 2000, newspaper print advertising was right at 68 nationally, $68 billion, 2000. 2017, it was around $15 billion, difference of $53 billion. So there is a problem, okay? How many of y'all read a newspaper? Okay. How many of y'all get your, get your news on Twitter? Mm -hmm. And that's fine, doesn't matter where you get it, as long as you get it. But here, here's one thing I want to impress upon y'all. The platforms that today that you think 
for the New Deal and the way they are, and we found the way to do this to get information out that you think is going to be here forever is going to change. There's something out there, several things out there now that we've never heard of that's going to make those things I just mentioned, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, iPhone, obsolete. And it's going to do it quicker than you think. Adapt, adapt, adapt. You have to adapt. And it's going to change. Welcome it. Don't fight it. Welcome it. No matter how much you disagree, welcome it. But you know one thing is never, ever, ever, ever going to change. Never going to change. People love a good story. It's why they buy books. It's why they go to the movies. It's why they read stories online. They always love a good story. I do. Is anybody in here done love a good story? So always, always remember that. I was talking, uh, Larry Brown was my, is, been one of my been one of my favorite authors uh, was one of my favorite authors still is we lost him a few years ago uh, was a fireman in Oxford who just decided he wanted to write and I always kidded Larry that he was the only guy I ever knew who loved the process of writing he loved the actual process of sitting down and bleeding onto his keyboard and, and, and working page after page after page. Not getting sleep, just writing. He loved it. Tom Franklin, another writer up here, I think he's in Germany or somewhere now, right now, but which figures. Uh, but I asked Tom one day, do, do you like writing? And he said, uh, mm, I like having written. And I know what he means. People ask me, do you like writing? Uh-uh. Uh-uh. The process is gruesome. Some, some days easier than others. Those days that where it just comes and flows and you know you've got it are so rare. Most of the time it's just it's just work and you're exhausted when it's over. But that feeling when you're when you're done. is worth all the stuff that you go through to write it. Here's a, uh, a quote from Faulkner. Writing should be fun, and it should be exciting. Maybe not as you write, but after, but after it is done. You should feel an excitement, a passion. That doesn't mean feeling proud, sitting there gloating over what you've done. It means you know you've done your best, and next time it will be better. Y'all have heard of the 10,000 hour thing where if you're going to become an expert at something, you, you do it 10,000 hours, and supposedly then you know how to do what you do? There's something to that. It really is. But I, I've had people, even at the office, people will say, ah, it, it's, it, it, it's, it's easy for you because you, you've done it so long. And I said, my, my computer screen is blank just like yours every time. It never becomes easy. Never will. Don't expect it to. Never expect it to. Y'all have anything y'all want to 
talk about, ask about, anything like that. We want to open it up for questions. So y'all tell Billy what, you, uh, what do you want to know. I've reported a lot. <coughs> A favorite story? Yeah. Ooh. Uh, <coughs> yeah, I, I se several. I mean, it's just it's just hard to it's hard to pick them out. It it, it really is. But the, I don't know if there's any baseball. Uh, fans of, uh, in here, but uh, a guy pitched for the Red Sox, Dennis Oilcan Boyd, back, he's from Meridian, uh, pitched in the World Series back in the, back in the 80s. Uh, I did a story on his family, and uh, It turns out his brothers, Dennis was the youngest one. And Dennis was able to, to play baseball in, 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 in high school. He played at Jackson State, and then he went on and played with the Red Sox. The other, the other brothers, for whatever reason, were never able to do that. They had to go to work. And he, they never got a chance to to go to college, they didn't get a chance to go to the pros, nothing like that. And they always called him the chosen one. He was the chosen one. Another story about their family and about how they used to play. Dennis would be 14, 15, playing with grown men. And it was these traveling teams that would come through. And it was and Dennis, Dennis was, a, was a live wire now. He, he was a, a, the kind of guy who would strike somebody out and hit his, you know, hit his glove and point his finger, and that's not real big in, in, in Major League Baseball. But his brothers told me that's the way he was brought up to play. That's how we played other teams. They would, to infuriate batters, the infield, would sit down and turn their back to home plate while the guy was batting. And the guy just right by him, strike him out. That gave me a, an insight to who Dennis Boyd was. But it told me so much about that time period before Dennis, when, when Dennis was growing up. All those teams coming together on Sunday afternoon. Some of the greatest baseball you could possibly see playing on this little sandlot field in Meridian, tucked away. And people would come and pay money to, to see it. But they had to know about it, and not that many people knew. But they just played for the love of the game. And then Dennis went on and, and, and had a great career with the, with the Red Sox. And, and, uh, uh, his dad said, I, the, the final quote was, of that story, I, I remember it was, I've never told him I'm proud of him, but I guess it's time I did so. And this was after he pitched in the World Series. And I thought, that's, that's pretty cool. Tell your son, yeah, you, tell your son you're proud of him. That one sticks with me. It, it, it really does. Uh, I, I, another one is, is interviewing John Young. John Young was an Apollo astronaut who walked on the moon and slept three nights on the moon. And I could not, it, after you, I was in sports for, for a long time and covered Super Bowls and all that. And you, you, you kind of quickly get over the, the star deal. You, you, you kind of lose that after a while. But I could not take my eyes off this guy during the interview. It was just like, what is he seen? What, what, what has he experienced? 
And uh, that interview changed me. It changed how I looked at when I look up. Uh, he had all these dreams of building a base on the moon because sooner or later, sooner or later, an asteroid was going to take the Earth out. I don't doubt anything John Young said. Pretty smart guy. That one sticks out. Uh, I'm drawing a blank on others, but those kind. It's always about people. They can give you a story about income tax. But what's that story really about? People. Every story is going to wind up being about people, and that's what you got to make it. You got to make it about people. Advice when you're like you have the content that you want to write about, but you're just kind of stuck. Like, Get how stuck. Do you work through that. It's a great question, <laughs> by the way. Oh, uh, you know, you know what I found. I've, I've really found this. If you repeat the question so they can hear it. I'm sorry. If you repeat the question so they can hear it. Okay. The question is: is when you have a story, and. Uh, you, you're, you're in the process of writing it, right? And you get stuck. I, I, I have found that usually if you get stuck, you don't have enough boards to build a house. And, and, and usually there's something missing where maybe you need to make one more phone call or two more phone calls or three more phone calls or go see the person or whatever. Um, and I'll tell you this, it never fails. If you just say, you know, I'm going to make one more phone call. Nine times out of ten, it's going to be gold. And, and it, I, I don't know why. I don't know what it is about that last phone call. But it's something about making that one more call that takes a story from here to there. And uh, Ronnie Agnew, uh, who's in the Ole Miss Hall of Fame, and he was my, my editor for several years. Great guy. Loves Ole Miss football. Never bought a ticket to a game, though. You always find somebody that has them. Uh, I kid him about that. But uh, there was a, when 9-11 happened, uh, I wrote a little short piece about it, and I don't know how it got in their hands, but uh, uh, public radio, they were putting together this thing in New York about bringing people from different parts of the country, and, and, and for some reason I got invited to that. And, uh, and then went to the they had a viewing stand of where you could go and look at the 9-11 site. This was in February after it happened in September. And, uh, and then I was going to come back and write about it. And uh, I was working on the story, and Ronnie had not seen anything I had written, not seen it. And he came by my desk, and he said, have you got it? I said, I got it. He said, no, no, no. I mean, have you got it? And I thought, I said, I'll get back to you. I didn't have it. I had to go deeper. I had to really go deeper. It's funny, I talked to him just last week and told him that story again. I said, you know, you, you educated me in 2001 in a way, or 2002 in a way that uh, I hear your voice every time I write a story now. Have I got it? You know, one thing, and this, will, this, this may answer part of your question. I have a deal where 
people say they have a trouble, they have trouble organizing. If it's a longer story, they have trouble organizing. You know, where, what goes where and, and how do you keep the flow and all that. And I have, I have this. I don't know if y'all can see it or not, but, but it's that. It's just circles and stuff. And what, what I mean by this is, and I don't even know where I came up with this, but it just it works for me, is this is the story. This is all the stuff that you've, you've done interviews and research and, and all that. And then you, 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 you come on in here and it's maybe a little deeper and then you come on in here and then you get to right there and that's the story. That's the story right there. And you write from there out instead of writing from there in. That's where people get in trouble, I think. Just the, the, the people I've worked with at the paper, uh, as, as they, they call it a mentor, but I don't, I, don't, I don't really feel like that. I feel like a, a co-worker, just like struggling like they are. But um, that is, they, they've told me that's helped them to really focus in on the story. And it kind of frees you up. You don't, you don't feel overwhelmed by so much information. You don't, and you don't feel like you have to get everything in the seventh par by the seventh paragraph. Now you do in news. I mean, you, you might want to get the, the news in the first few paragraphs, but uh, not in feature writing or, or, or uh, tease them a little bit and, and, and want them to want them to write to to read more. Especially these days. Other questions right there on the front. It was mentioned that you were newly retired. What do you plan on doing now? I'm sorry. It was mentioned that you were newly retired. What do you plan on doing now? Um. The the question is that I have retired and what am I going to do now? Um. Uh, I don't know how to work on a car. <laughs> I, I, I don't know how to cook much. Uh, I, I really don't know how to do anything but write, if I know, if I know that. Uh, but uh, I appreciate your question. Uh, my last day was January 2nd, and I, I told myself that I was going to take three months to just kind of clear my head. And, uh, and I've got a a couple of opportunities coming up that, uh, to do some writing, and, uh, and I've also got a project that I want to work on. I've been doing interviews for about 12 years on it, and, uh, and I, I, I want to work on that some too. But I'm, I'm going to write. It's really the only thing I know how to do, you know. I'm worthless. <laughs> I'm sorry. Have you ever thought about writing a book about your experiences over the years? Well, um, the question is, if I ever thought about writing a book about my experiences, you know, um, that's intimidating to me because I, I wonder why people would care what, you know, really you look at it like that. And, and, but what I am trying to do, and I just talked to somebody yesterday, a, a publisher yesterday, about I'm trying to get my stories to do a, to do a collection of stories, and that's what I'm hoping hoping to do. My brothers own me to write one just like what you're saying, and uh, and you know what? May, maybe I maybe I will. You buy one. <laughs> I appreciate that. Uh, I have a lot of people tell me that, but I, I just you know I just. Uh, Maybe I need to consider it more. I appreciate that question. Talking about people um, coming into the lives of people you don't know and telling stories that aren't yours, is there a way to do that nobly or is it inherently selfish? All right, speak up for me again. Coming into the lives of people you don't know and telling stories that aren't yours, is uh, there a way to do that nobly or is it inherently selfish? How do you reconcile like, your idea? Of your role as a storyteller throughout your career. I'm 
I want to make sure I know what you mean before I answer, you know. Yeah, you mean people that I just don't know, and 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 meet them for the first time, and write about them. That's tough. Oh, that that's that's tough. Question is how you you know writing about stories about people that you don't know. Am I right? And and how do you go about that? Um, I try to talk to a lot of friends of the. Of the person, I try to talk to relatives if I have, if possible. Uh, you know, some some of the some of the stories that I somebody w we needed a story on some on, on a person, and they would not talk. They just would not do the interview, and it sort of fits what you're saying. They wouldn't do the interview. But I had to have the story. Sometimes I've found that, you, that the stories work out better when they don't talk to you. Because you have to dig and find people who know them, and they tell you things about themselves. And I don't mean bad things. I mean good things. They'll tell you things that they wouldn't have said about themselves. And it kind of gives you a, a different thing. Bobby Gentry. Uh, if I could interview one, well, if I could interview two people, one would be, first one would be Neil Armstrong, first guy on the moon, and second one would be Bobby Gentry. She was a Mississippi songwriter, uh, wrote Ode to Billy Joe. Any, how many of y'all know that song? That is, I'm telling you, that is, uh, that is literature. Ode to Billy Joe. Please read those lyrics. If you don't listen to the song, at least read those lyrics. She, uh, she had number one hits. She uh, sang, you know, they, she wrote with Glenn Campbell, sang with Glenn Campbell, uh, just had a great career going, and she just disappeared in about the mid 80s. And about three years ago, I wrote something. Uh, Ode to Billy Joe starts out, it was the 3rd of June, another sleepy Delta dusty day. Another sleepy dusty Delta day. And I wrote a story about how that song had haunted me ever since I'd heard it. It was the number one hit in 1967. And I wrote about it. And I talked to some people who had worked with her. And they couldn't get in touch with her. And everybody was like, if you find her, please tell her to, you know, call me. And I wrote the story. And I could not believe the people who responded to that story. I, to this day, I'm getting the emails, have you found Bobby Gentry? And the truth is, I have. I know where she lives. Uh, and I've done a lot of thinking about this. Um, I could go knock on her door But you know what? I guarantee you, she's read that story. I guarantee you she's read that story. Too many people, I mean, I got emails from Vietnam. I got emails from everywhere about this story. They want to know where Bobby's entry is. She has, she has had to have seen that story. 
And I just, if she wants to be, to live her life, in, you know, privately, and, and I don't know what drove her out of the business. I don't, I don't know what, what happened, uh, but I would love to talk to her. But her brother, I did talk to her brother, and he sent me a picture of her. He said, I ask you not to share this. He said, but I'm going to, he said, I thought you'd like to see this. And it was a picture of her and him. And she was a, a beautiful woman in 1967. And she's a beautiful woman today. And, uh, and she looked. I've studied that photograph. She looked happy. She looked really happy. And I just said, I'm not, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to be the guy to go knock on the door. I'm just not going to do it. I've done it. I've done it many a time, knock on doors. Uh, but not, not, not here. I, if, I gave her my contact information in the store at the bottom. If you ever want to talk, call me here. My, here's my email, my physical address, whatever. But um, I would love to talk to her. Please read the lyrics to, to Ode to Billy Joe, but I hope you'll listen to the song. Great. I got a question for you. You've talked a lot about your writing process, but could you tell, talk to us a little bit about how you approach the interview? I mean, what is it like to to have the confidence to sit there and talk to somebody about their starvation and their hunger pains? And how do you form the? I mean, the the crux of the story, right? He's trying to tell us his details and listening and paying attention and gathering all those little bits of information. But how do you approach that in a in an interview? I've got some students in here. I won't speak for everybody, but a lot <laughs> of us have trouble talking to our neighbor uh, about what they had for breakfast yesterday. I know what you mean. I know. Somebody over at campus. Yeah. Break, how do you approach that interview process? Because because that's really where the stories you're talking about come from. That's a great question, too. I, uh, I, I ask a lot of writers, I mean, I ask, how do, how do you, uh, first of all, I, I try to do as much homework as possible before I go, before I interview somebody. It's, it's nothing worse than to ask, and, and th this is true of, Somebody who is well, maybe well known has a website and, and that sort of thing, and it's really two different things. But if they're if they're well known enough to have a bio and all that, it, it is a it's it's it is a no no to ask them a question that you could have found with just a little bit of effort. And I think that kind of takes them. You know, I think that irritates them a little bit. But I try to do as much homework as possible. And I try to do the interview in person, if at all possible. Because you're going to find things out about the person in person that, than, than you ever, ever will on the phone. Uh, what pictures they have on the wall. Uh, just things like that. But really, I, I, I don't come in with a notebook and a pen, and I, I don't, I come in as a, and most of the stories I write about are about Mississippians, I come in as a fellow Mississippian. And we talk, and I, we just, we just kind of talk for a little while. And, uh, and it's not really a, it's, I'm not doing it really as a game. I'm doing it to just, I just want them to know I'm, you know, I'm there just as a, as a person. I'm not there as a reporter or a writer or whatever. I'm just, I'm just, I'm just, I'm just there as a fellow Mississippian. And just conversation and, uh, 
one of the toughest stories I've had to do was one of, was like the next to last story that I wrote for the ledger, and it was about a uh, a U.S. marshal, and his name was Josie Wells. His daddy named him after the the character in the Clint Eastwood movie, and uh, he had been killed in a raid of a drug house in Louisiana. It was a young, young couple, and uh, she had promised him that she would own her own business in three years from the time they got married, and then uh, he really, he really pushed her to to accomplish things, and 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 she pushed him, and so I talked to her when she opened the business, had completed the promise to him. And uh, she was pregnant when he, when he got killed. And I was dreading that interview. But uh, when she walked in, we just, she came to the paper and we went in a conference room, which I don't like to do, but we did that. And we just, you know, I said, I appreciate you doing the story and that sort of thing. But then I said, uh, do you have any pictures of your son? I'd like to see him. And yeah, so she got her phone and started showing me pictures of him, telling me about him, how he looked like his dad, how he acted like his dad. Uh, how she wanted him to always remember his dad, which of course he never saw him. But you could take a picture with a picture of his mom and his dad and say, who is that? Three years old. My mom and my dad. So he would know him by, by his face. But I dreaded that interview. I dreaded it because her world crumbled in a matter of seconds. But she sat there and told me everything, everything. Their last conversation, their, all that. And the best thing I did was I didn't say a word. I just let her talk. And she talked for five hours. And I think it did her good just to do that. So answer the question, just be, just be a person. Just be yourself. And hopefully that works. Maybe we can sit down here and listen to you for five hours. <laughs> So students have other classes to go to. Remember the 101, give your papers to Shima and, and give Mr. Watson the Thank you. Thank you.